Hello, I'm joined today by Dr. Niklas Mulder, who is an assistant professor in modern European history at Cornell University in the United States. Uh, Dr. Mulder, uh, very nice of you to join us for this discussion. Now, you finished a doctorate uh, at Columbia University in the United States looking at the antecedents or the start of the whole concept of economic sanctions. And you're shortly going to publish a book called The Economic Weapon. But it's fair to say that in a lot of European countries, um, and indeed for many European governments, um, sanctions are usually considered as the peaceful option, uh, the option that avoids war or violence, or indeed precludes war and violence. But if I understand it correctly, the antecedents of the idea a century ago were rather different. That's right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, for the invitation to, to talk about uh, the book. Um, yes, the origins of sanctions are actually belligerent. So they, they stem from uh, World War I, in fact. And uh, one of the big points that uh, the book tries to make is to actually establish that sanctions have a history and that it's actually a more recent one than we usually think. Um, a lot of people uh, identify any kind of economic pressure uh, going back all the way to Thucydides and the Athenians as possibly sanctions. But the actual idea of isolating countries uh, in a coercive way in order to achieve some kind of political goal and also to do this in peacetime, so to not go as far as war, paradoxically originates in the blockade that the Allies started in World War I. And that's where the book starts. So the blockades of World War I, in the psyche of those who were at Versailles and those who put together the League of Nations in 1919, 1920, for them, the, the blockade of uh, Germany and Austro-Hungary of the Axis powers was considered uh, a great success, no? The central powers buckled under. Do you think it was a success? Is it, can we now, with a view of a hundred years perspective, see those sanctions as those were brought down the central powers? Well, it's a very interesting debate. And I think that actually the jury is still out on it in many respects. The conviction at the time uh, after World War I itself was that the blockade had worked and it had been decisive. But there were also very good reasons, I think, for that, which is that a lot of people in allied countries in Britain and France uh, saw the trench warfare on the Western Front as having been rather futile. There was a very strong cultural desire to um, think of the war as having produced more peaceful methods. And so the blockade became this thing that it was very attractive to believe in. And moreover, as you mentioned, uh, the people who were involved in the blockade, many of them, and uh, Robert Cecil, who was the British Minister of Blockade, was one of the lead negotiators of the British delegation at the Versailles Conference, uh, who actually crafted, together with Woodrow Wilson, uh, Article 16, which is the sanctions article of the League of Nations Covenant. So the experience of these policymakers went directly into this new international organization. And I think it's very interesting to talk of also about the uh, what in fact happened. Uh, and, and I think that it's very difficult to ascertain precisely because uh, as we now know in the time of coronavirus, right, uh, at the time there was also a global pandemic, the Spanish flu. Uh, there was already a lot of exhaustion from the war. There were internal dislocations in the war economies of Germany and Austria-Hungary. So there are a lot of confounding factors and it's not very easy to identify the blockade as having been decisive. Um, but it is a very uh, interesting debate. But it was decisive in terms of those who framed the post-First World War uh, sort of security structure. In, it was embedded, as you said, in the, uh, in the covenant of the League of Nations, and it was embedded in a lot of the activities of uh, the, the, the powers during the 1920s and the 30s. Walk us through what you think was... Uh, the practice in the 20s and 30s with sanctions? Yes, so um, it was definitely believed and, it, and, and uh, there was a big campaign also to really affirm this belief that the blockade had been decisive. And uh, as I mentioned, it was partially because people wanted to have a new kind of peace preservation instrument. And that's what Article 16 did. So it essentially allowed the League of Nations to impose sanctions on its members if they refused 
to follow the instructions of the League Council in a dispute. So usually these were border disputes uh, of some kind, uh, clashes over minorities, treaty enforcement, and um, sanctions were seen as a result of their origins in blockade as a deterrent. So the hope was that uh, precisely this memory of the blockade and of deprivation was so frightening, and so many people on the European continent had had experience of uh, deprivation, hunger, disease, etc., cetera, um, in uh, the First World War, that this memory could be mobilized and that the threat of sanctions being imposed would already have a big and powerful effect in and of itself. And I think that that's important because when we think of sanctions today, we very often uh, impose them quite easily and quite quickly. And hence, uh, political scientists and international relations scholars who study sanctions usually uh, look at cases of application. And in the interwar period, actually, sanctions were generally designed not to have to be applied. The idea was that if you simply threatened them, and if the League of Nations and the great powers on the council threatened them, that it would work. And there were two particular cases in the 1920s where that seemed to have worked as well. The first was in the fall of 1921, when Yugoslavia was uh, in, busy um, essentially at the border of Albania, uh, fomenting unrest. And it was partially because uh, the, the northern border of Albania had not been fixed right before World War I broke out, so they were able to profit from that kind of ambiguity. And Lloyd George, in November 1921, made this threat, and the Yugoslavs backed down, and they actually solved the conflict uh, peacefully in the end. Uh, the very, very short sort of skirmishes, but it, it blew over fairly quickly. And that was at the time seen as a really big success, because of course, World War I had started in the Balkans. And so the, there were really a lot of people in uh, late 1921 who feared that there might be a fourth Balkan War within the space of just 20 years or so. And the second case uh, was also in the Balkans four years later, and that was in um, late 1925. And at that time, a sanctions threat was used by the League of Nations against Greece, which was embroiled in a border war with Bulgaria, uh, also infamously known as the War of the Stray Dog because of its <laughs> rather uh, yeah, um, funny origins. But it, again, in that case, uh, Greece folded very quickly. And so as a result in the 1920s, sanctions acquired a, a quite credible status as a deterrent. But the problem was that they were only tried out in that sense against smaller countries. And that I think also is important to take into account when we think about why sanctions failed to deter aggressor states in the 1930s, that these were much larger states. These were states that had an opportunity to fight back to, through policy and economic reorganization, also defend themselves. And I think that's where it got more problematic. Now, in your work, you refer to the kind of fundamental changes that state structures had to acquire in order to make these sanctions, to, to execute these sanctions in terms of collecting data. Tell us about that, because we take it for granted now that when, uh, let's say, foreign ministers of the European Union go to get, get together and decide to impose certain sanctions, so they know precisely who the sanctions should go again and what these would entail in economic terms. But uh, you suggest that this was quite a novelty to governments in the early 20th century. Yes, so I think it's important to remember that the early 20th century was also, especially before World War I, an age of really thriving economic and financial globalization on a very liberal and laissez-faire kind of um, set of assumptions and, and institutions. And as a result, um, the, uh, there wasn't necessarily a whole lot that states knew at any given time about all the sort of trade that was going on. This was a really ongoing project. And in Britain, for example, the Board of Trade was at the forefront of mapping what the world economy really looked like. Uh, in the 1910s and 1920s, during World War I and then in the, um, in the first post-war decade, uh, that took a leap forward, and the blockade in the war itself had been run by specific intelligence bodies. So anything, uh, consular information from foreign office diplomats on the ground, um, intercepted uh, cables that were intercepted on transatlantic telegraph lines that were underseas, um, any kind of human intelligence that they could find, uh, reading newspapers uh, of the opponent, all that was basically collated into a large intelligence gathering apparatus uh, to use against particular shipments of goods and, and to try and intercept them. And that's fairly well documented. 
what uh, has not really been looked into is how the League of Nations then took on that role. And the League of Nations was in many ways a very pioneering institution of international economic governance because it had an economic and financial section, the essentially forerunner, one might say, of what institutions like the IMF and the World Bank do today. Um, it, from 1930 onward, had, onward had a, an economic intelligence service. But the League was very uh, hesitant at initially, actually, to start gathering this sort of information about uh, its own member states' economic vulnerabilities because it was meant still, and it was um, among the people, the businessmen and the, the private sector um, uh, part stakeholders, essentially, uh, it was really um, a priority to restore the pre-world kind of laissez-faire world on a gold standard basis. Uh, and so this kind of in more intrusive uh, intelligence gathering was, was definitely resisted. So it was an ongoing project. For those who worked during the um, during that period, uh, do you think that by the time the league sort of ran out of steam, as it were, in the late 30s, people still considered sanctions as a potent instrument, as the something that should be preserved in the international order? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. So I think that there it's important to clear up. A, um, a misconception that's kind of snuck into a lot of the historiography and our understanding of what went wrong in the 1930s. And um, I think for a long time, it was thought that uh, there were essentially idealists who believed in something called collective security, which was embodied in the League. And there were more realistic uh, opponents. And some of them uh, wanted to strike deals with uh, aggressors like uh, Germany and it Italy and Japan. Uh, whereas others were uh, more confrontational. Um, actually, I think when you take the economic weapon of the League seriously, and also when you look at uh, the documents uh, that, for example, in Germany, both in Weimar Germany, but also in Nazi Germany in the 1930s, um, from their perceptions of what the League was doing, it's clear that they took its economic blockade and sanctions function very seriously, actually. They were uh, actually went to very great lengths uh, first to avoid triggering it, but then also secondly, in the 1930s, they actually made several proposals to reform the covenant. And they said, we're willing to remain in the league, but only if it removes its sanctions power. And that goes against a lot of our conceptions of what went on in the 1930s, where we think that the League of Nations was weak. And ultimately what we just required was massive rearmament and the allies to come together in the same way. And international organization had basically been a kind of distraction uh, a false start and too naive. Uh, I think actually, given that it mobilized the memory of blockade in World War I, uh, there's quite a strong case to be made that uh, this deterrent effect did drive parts of the policies of Italy and Germany. And certainly when the League imposed sanctions on Italy after its invasion of Ethiopia in 1935, uh, after that, uh, both Italy and later on Germany, uh, I think also really intensified their drive uh, towards economic autarky. So in all these vulnerabilities that they had uh, towards oil sanctions, for example, they made strong efforts to try and become independent of imports. And that's something that you cannot really explain by just invoking the Great Depression because it was extremely inefficient to try and make your own oil from coal. Uh, it was very expensive. So only if you had a really strong overriding a non-economic reason to do it, an ideological or a strategic reason, did it actually make sense? And so I think that in that sense, we've also missed the effect that sanctions have had on the intensifying the, the movement towards autarky in the 1930s. And that was unintended, but it was a, a kind of important unintended consequence of uh, the economic weapon nonetheless. So fascinating. So basically what you're saying is that the League had teeth that some of the most important canines teeth in this affair were actually uh, the sanctions regime, but that they were not very often uh, used. Absolutely. And uh, especially if you look at crises like the Rhineland annexation, for example, in 1936, which is really a kind of Rubicon for uh, Hitler's aggression, uh, the moment where he not only, he had already broken the Versailles Treaty before by uh, reinstating conscription in 1935, but remilitarizing the Rhineland was the first time that he really militarily expanded in Europe. And he only did so once he realized in February and early March 1936 that the League of Nations would not 
impose oil sanctions on Italy. Because if the league had managed to do that, and Anthony Eden was a proponent, um, it also depended on Roosevelt in the United States and on uh, the French government. So it was a very difficult coordination game. If he had done so, I think it's definitely open to question whether Hitler would have moved. Um, so it's important, I think, to realize that there was a lot of bluster about how the league was inefficient and uh, it, it didn't have teeth. Um, and I think exactly going back to its origins uh, and the fact that this economic weapon cast rather a large and, and powerful uh, shadow over interwar politics is a way of kind of throwing some fresh light onto that and also thinking about what could have be, been done better, essentially. Yeah. We were approaching the end of our discussion, which has been most interesting. I wonder if I could ask you whether you are aware of any discussions at the start or during the League, the period of the League of Nations, on the so-called smart sanctions, mm -hmm. on the idea of targeting them specifically, and especially on the discussion between sanctions that hurt the population at large and those which are meant to hurt only the leaders of a recalcitrant country. Yes, yeah, so um, the term smart sanctions originates in the 1990s with the Iraq sanctions regime that the UN and the United States and Britain uh, imposed on, on Saddam Hussein. And of course, there, there was a lot of uh, controversy over the amount of civilian suffering that was partially caused by them. And uh, that's when we have recently started talking about smart sanctions. Um, in the interwar years, there wasn't such a specific concept but because a lot of the blockade had also been run on a quite individual basis. So it, it was really about intercepting uh, uh, individual uh, payments and transfers to banks and individuals. There was experience in uh, going to a very granular level of policy. So they didn't have the concept, but a, a lot of the actual um, practice in, in policymaking terms definitely was already there. And in terms of, I think my final question is, um, when you look at the sanctions regime of today, and especially this whole dispute about extraterritoriality application and the leading role that the United States has in imposing some of these sanctions, what would you, what would you say has still been kept in terms of an ethos or in terms of ideas from the sanction regimes, the beginnings a hundred years ago? Yes. So one of the important developments in the background uh, of the interwar period and, and the instruments uh, uh, that sanctions are uh, essentially serves a, a new principle and a new ideal in interstate relations, which is the ban on aggression, which didn't exist before World War I. It's a part of the League Covenant and it's made really powerful, uh, or at least it's formally declared uh, to be a problem uh, in 1928 with the Kellogg-Briand Treaty. Um, and nowadays we use sanctions a lot for all sorts of domestic policy things, human rights protection, non-proliferation, uh, all sorts of domestic policies uh, essentially can provoke sanctions. At the time, that was generally not considered to be a valid reason for imposing it, but a dispute between states that might trigger war was. So the sole and overriding aim of interwar sanctions was really preventing another war like World War I. And in that sense, I think uh, one of the important uh, concomitant developments of that period was that neutrality, which had been a very important principle in international law for the preceding centuries, came under quite a lot of pressure. Because in a world, of course, where neutral states were able to continue trading with aggressors, sanctions wouldn't work because there would be loopholes in them and there would they would leak essentially sanctions regimes and embargoes and the rise of sanctions therefore also went hand in hand with a kind of very strong diplomatic and legal and political offensive on the part of the league of nations to end neutrality as it existed and that's something that we can see in the extraterritoriality um, in a sense as well uh, the stigmatization of countries that continue to trade with particular uh, outlaw states. So in that sense, um, there are there's something that, that has carried over from, from that period as well. Yeah. And a lot of these pressures were extra legal in a sense yeah. that a lot of the time there was no precedent for them or legal instruments for them, but there were pressures from countries that presumably had an economic superiority and therefore their voices counted. 
Well, Dr. Mulder, um, I'm very, very grateful indeed. I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating subject. It's a serious subject, as you know, that faces the UK now, that we are out of the European Union and will have to conceive of our own sanction regime. So it's always a great uh, interest to see how the concept started and how it evolved. Uh, on behalf of us, I'm very, very grateful for your contribution and good luck with the launch of the book. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to uh, talk to Lucy about it.